Good day everyone! I hope you are all safe. By the way, I'm Shaira Vistarshan, AB Political Science, third year, and I am going to report two topics on their classical and neoclassical economics. First is Malthus and Godwin, second is Utilitarianism, and these are the objectives of my report. To introduce Godwin and Malthus theory, to differentiate the concepts of Godwin and Malthus, and to discuss Utilitarianism. Let's start with the first topic, Godwin and Malthus. So let me have a short introduction of these two. William Godwin was a social philosopher, political journalist, and religious dissenter. He is famous of his work entitled An Inquiry in Concerning Political Justice and Its Influence on General Virtue and Happiness. The object of his report was to reject conventional government. So in this sense, he's against the government and he wants to abolish the state because he believes in humans, perfectibility, and rationality. And we will further discuss this later in Anna Iham Pagatang. Thomas Robert Malthus was an English economist and demographer who is best known for his theory that population growth outruns the food supply, which I will be able to discuss also later. Let's examine first the theory of Godwin. The first concept na atong lantawan about kay Godwin is on his concept of humanity. William Godwin, in his book entitled Inquiry Concerning the Principle of Political Justice, posited that humans were capable of perpetual improvement. Or shall we say, humans were capable of non-stop improvement, as well as that men were naturally benevolent creatures who become the more so with an ever greater application of rationality of their lives. Because of this what we so-called rationality, men are able for improvement and progress. And lastly, Godwin assumed that perfectibility is one of the most unequivocal characteristics of the human species, which leads to progressive improvement to human lives. So Godwin believes those things about human creature, nga ang tao kay bright, able sila of improvement, progress, and development, especially within the society they belong to. Ang tungod ana nga iya nga paglantaw, nagtuo siya nga dapat walay mapugong og mo limit sa capability sa tao kay mauna ang makapa-improve og develop sa society according niya. And the next concept nga atong lantaw is on Godwin's concept of government. As what I said earlier, the object of Godwin's work was to reject conventional government and it is because on his concept of humanity, nga perfect, rational, benevolent and able of non-stop improvement ang tao. Ug tungod ana ang tao dili na magkinahanglan og government. Kay ang government as what Godwin's define should be abolished since they oppress and infringe liberty. He also provided a central idea that man once freed from all artificial political and social constraints, man stood in perfect rational harmony with the world. Kay para sa iya, state interventions, laws, punishments, or any other forms of political and social controls is the reason why human could not fully express himself tungod aning mga restrictions and limitations set by the government. And society can only progress if state encourage people to decide and think for, for themselves. So to sum up, gusto niya i-abolish ang state kaya according to him, makababag ang government sa pag-exercise sa tao sa ilahang rationality. Kung ma-abolish na ang state, humans can then now fully exercise their rationality and perfectibility. Additionally, because of his belief in human perfectibility, he speculates on the possibility of immortality and elimination of aging. Because according to him, for if the mind will one day become omnipotent, why may not man be one day immortal? So, mani na takaroon sa iyahang concept sa population. So, elimination of aging means population growth. Kaya wala na ba yung magtigulang, wala na, dugay na kayo mamatay ang mga tao. And according to him, population growth would not be a problem. Kaya kung limitahan daw ang population, humanity will refuse to propagate. Kaya para sa iya, dapat magdaghan nga magdaghan lang ang tao. Kaya ang tao ang makapa-improve o develop sa society. Kaya tungon sa ilang rationality. On the other hand, Malthus believed that human progress would be limited by uncontrollable human passion, by which he meant sex. So, balipod iya ha, ingon siya, dili mag-progress ang human kung dili makontrol ang population. Kaya nga no, 
making population over time inevitably increase more rapidly than food supplies, according to Malthus. So, for Malthus, overpopulation is a very big problem. So, now provide you two basic principles on the effect of population on food supply. First, while population tended to grow ge geometrically, 2, 4, 8, 16, food production increased only arithmetically, 2, 3, 4, 5. So the population will grow faster than the supply of foods. Specifically, it postulates that continued population growth will eventually outstrip the limited resources of our world. So Malthus suggests that a population control through positive checks and preventive checks. He believed that through preventive checks and positive checks, the population would be controlled to balance the food supply with the population level. First is positive checks or natural checks. He believed that natural forces would correct the imbalance between food supply and population growth in the form of natural disasters, such as floods, earthquakes, and human-made actions such as wars and famines. Kito para ani mugamay ang population sa world. Second is preventive checks. Malthus also suggested using preventive measures to control the growth of population. This measure includes family planning, late marriages, and celibacy. In conclusion, on Malthus' theory, population growth will always tend to outrun the food supply and that betterment of humankind is impossible without strict limits on reproduction. Let's then now differentiate the concept of Godwin and Malthus. For Godwin, population growth is not a problem, while Malthus believes that overpopulation is a very big problem. Godwin believes also that population growth leads to human progress because of humans' perfectibility. In contrast, Malthus believes that population growth outstrips the limited resources of our world and reproduction should be controlled. Let's proceed to the second topic which is utilitarianism, but let's tackle first the brief history of utilitarianism. During the early 19th century, political economy changed in style. Early moral notions about human nature were elaborated by the British Enlightenment philosopher and political economist Jeremy Bentham. Bentham thought that the social problems of late 18th and early 19th century England were attributable control of the economy by a hereditary landed gentry. In seeking to correct this shortcoming, Bentham sought to find some criteria for validating ethical behavior that could serve as the basis for a modern democratic system of law and government. That is why the concept of utilitarianism exists, kaya nagtuo siya nga pinaagi ano yung system, society will progress. So what is utilitarianism? Bentham's book declared that nature has placed mankind under the governance of two sovereign masters, pleasure which made all people happy, and pain which everyone hated. So utilitarianism holds that an action is right if it tends to promote happiness or pleasure, and wrong if it tends to produce sadness or pain, not just for the performer of the action but also for everyone else affected by it. Basically, utilitarianism would say an action is right if it results in the happiness of the greatest number of people in a society or a group. Here's a very simple example. Let's say I'm a doctor and I have only five doses left of some very scarce medicine. And in an emergency situation, I'm left with six patients, all of whom need the drug to survive. But one of them, let's call her needy, will survive only if I give her all five doses of the drug. The other five patients can survive only a single dose each. Now, utilitarianism will tell us to divide up the drug saving the five patients and allowing one patient to die. Why? Because saving the five preserves much more happiness and prevents much more sufferings than saving just one life. Utilitarianism tells us the end do justify the means if the moral gain of the ends are greater than the moral loses by the means. Now, let's see the principal function of the government in utilitarianism. The principal function of government in utilitarianism is to guard against pain. Government did this by creating rights that are conferred on individuals. Rights of personal security, rights of protection for honor, rights of property, and rights to receive aid in case of need. Punishing criminals was an effective way of deterring crime by changing the perception of the value committing it. This is to discourage future doings. 
In conclusion, on the topic of utilitarianism, under utilitarianism, the government's social policies should be evaluated in terms of their effects on the well-beings of the people they affected. And utilitarian philosophy law should be used to maximize the happiness of society. Therefore, Bentham's utilitarianism became the philosophical basis of the reform movement in 19th century Britain. And that ends my report for today. And I hope you have learned something about my report. God bless everyone and thank you for listening.